This is my life. I can't distinguish between the enemy. The good or the bad. All of them look the same. But who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? They, was, they all look alike. So how can you tell? All of them look the same. Who is the enemy? How can you tell? was a woman. She was carrying something. Now, I didn't know if it was a weapon or what. How can you tell? This is my life. I can't distinguish between the enemy, the good or the bad. All of them look the same. But who is the enemy? Who is the enemy? They, was, they all look alike. So how can you tell? You know, I knew it was a woman. She was running with a back. She was carrying something. Now, I didn't know if it was a weapon or what. So, how can you tell? I was given an order to shoot. I didn't want to shoot a woman. So I'm thinking that she had a weapon. How can you distinguish between the enemy? She was carrying something. I'm thinking that she had a weapon running. The training came to me, the program to kill. And I just started killing. Started about three or four times. I and I turned over, it was a baby. And the bullet just went through and shot the baby too. I was given an order to shoot. I didn't want to shoot a woman. And I saw the baby face with her hair gone. And I just, just blinked. I just went. Let me tell you a little story. When I was seven years old, my daddy caught me smoking a cigar. Locked me in the broom closet for three days and three nights with nothing but a box of cigars and a book of matches. I'm gonna teach you to hate spending money. I'm gonna make you so sick of spending money that the mere 
mere sight of it will make you want to throw up. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. If you can do it, you get 300 million. You got the balls for it? You're not allowed to own any assets. Sounds easy, don't it? No houses, no cars, no jewelry. Nothing but the shirt on your back. I'm gonna go for the 300 million. Melvin. Melvin, give him $500. Yes, sir. How you doing, my man? All right. That's great. I just bought an iceberg. I'll pay you $2,000 a week to be the chief of my security. Would you like to work for more money than you ever made in your life? 200 people at $100 a head? No, we're home. $200. And uh, what's the most expensive one? Mike, um, I'm paying you $100,000 a month. Look at that out. $100,000, okay? $1,000? Thank you. You know, you could really help me out. How's that? Well, I'd like for you to redecorate my offices. I pay you, of course. $250,000? I, I, I don't know what to say. Say yes. Pay her $100,000 if that's not an insult. You're not allowed to tell anybody why you have to spend this money. Because I don't want anybody to help me out. Nobody helped me out in that closet with those cigars. I'm going to be a little crazy for a while. But I'm not crazy. People are going to think I'm crazy. You stick with me. You're my buddy. I don't get it. Yeah, what the hell is with him? He's trying to do some good with his money. Look, I finally figured this whole thing out. That's why he gets so upset when he makes a profit, because it makes him feel guilty. He's trying to do the right thing for once in his life. You don't understand. Nobody understands. I don't even understand anymore. And I am sick of money. Mr. I don't know how to explain this to you, but even though I'm not the person that you thought I was, you see, I'm not the person that you think I am now, either. Yes, but I don't understand why when you make money, you get so miserable, and when you lose it, you act so happy. As the executor of your great uncle's will, I hereby declare that the full inheritance of $300 million is yours. <laughs> Congratulations. What I feel is that, for me, it's been a great benefit that I have stopped smoking cannabis. My life has improved in huge numbers of ways. I still miss it. I would still love to fire up a joint. Once every four or five days, I could smoke a nice joint. And if I was confident, that I could just do that. If I was confident I could do that, I think I would carry on smoking cannabis. But I'm not confident I could. I became dependent on it. And that dependency did not serve me. I uh, reached a point where I needed to stop, and I did. Look, we all have to get through this physical life, and we, we need to meet our f physical needs. Uh, and it's uh, really tough, you know, if you're, if you're living on the streets and you don't have a roof over your head and, and you can't uh, clothe yourself or, or feed yourself adequately. I think it is important to pay attention to earning a living. You cannot avoid that. Uh, but try to find a way to do that where you don't have to sacrifice all your dreams. Um, try to find a way to make your dreams work for you. Don't let the dreams go. Don't sacrifice the dreams for the security of a career. Try to find a way where you can integrate the dreams into your career. Once, once you enter into the, the peer review process, then you've become one of them. 
Oh, I do try to play by their rules. The only way you're going to get those ideas in front of the public is not to go the, through the peer review process. The peer review process will filter you out right at the beginning. There's absolutely no question of becoming part of the club because the club, by definition, does not believe. So the only way is to appeal directly to the public and to present arguments and evidence. Um, I have increasingly played by their rules. I have increasingly footnoted and referenced and documented every statement that I make. But I don't kid myself for a moment that I would ever get that material in a mainstream. I, I just know for sure that I, would, that I would not. They regard me as the devil incarnate. I don't want to be in any business where I have to adhere to the rule of law. If I have to adhere to the rule of law, I'm getting out of the business. Law, not for me. Law for you. Law, not for me. Free money, no law. Everyone else is trapped. Is trapped in these little houses. They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos. Law for you! Law, not for me! Everyone else is trapped! They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos! thing is jail for the elite players. Nobody closes that black hole. They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos. I don't want to be in any business where I have to adhere to the rule of law. If I have to adhere to the rule of law, I'm getting out of the business. Law, not for me. Law for you. Law, not for me. Free money, no law. Everyone else is trapped. Is trapped in these little houses. They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos. Law for you. Law, not for me. Everyone else is trapped. They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos. There is no such thing as jail for the elite players. He's reinventing the game. Nobody closes that black hole. They're trapped in these little units, these little ghettos. Oh no, you keep it, you keep the loser. No, sorry, that was your money. That's your bet. I got the winners, you keep the losers. <laughs> I made more money. An ordinary person never even passes go. They don't get to collect the $200. The other bankers are there and they're getting 200 billion dollar freebies and because you're in the limelight because you're a celebrity and you look like you're a party animal they people 
assume you can do supernatural amounts of, of narcotics, of drugs. So I go to these little parties, right? And everybody else's line is like about an inch long. It's like, hey man, we're doing coke, buddy. <laughs> you know, little inch line long. I come in and go, oh, oh, it's Denison! Oh, oh, here's your line! <laughs> you know, it's like two feet long. There's rocks in it you could put in your driveway. It's not chopped up. I don't get a straw. I get a piece of a garden hose. Because they want to make sure it all goes through. Here, go, man, go, 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 you know. So I'm trying to be like, I'm trying to live up to the image. Oh, get out of my way. Watch me. Ah! And I would sniff all this shit up. About two minutes later, I'm walking around the party going, Hey, man. Hey, man, have you got any shoe polish or something I can drink to slow this down? You think shoe polish will kill you? I need something, man. There's nothing left to drink? I wish you'd have told me that before I did this stupid long line. You fuck. All right. Well, uh, listen, you guys keep partying. I'm going to go ahead and lay down and beg God to live for a while, all right? I'm just going to go ahead and lay down. You guys keep rocking. Keep rocking, man. And so then you lay down, and you grab your heart, and you make all those promises. I'll never do it again. I promise, God, just make it stop. Just make it slop, please. Just, just make it slow down. I'll never do it again until I feel better. I swear to God, until I feel better, I'll never do it again. I promise. I just... And I had enough of those fucking nights, and we lost a lot of good people to that shit. And I just think uh, if you're involved with it, get disinvolved with it, because you're just going to get busted or you're going to get sick and die. So that's all I got to say about that. And I think really the shamans are the people among us who represent the next evolutionary level. They are people who, are, who have learned to do what we can't do, to come and go from hyperspace, whatever it is, an informational superspace that exists inside the psychology of the individual and the group that we can't even see because we're materialists, fixated on the topological surfaces of the three-dimensional manifold, which is only one level in the onion of reality. These shamans have moved over to another level, but I think they are the paradigm for a new um, authentic, uh, authentication of the human, of the human experience. And it's all about experience. This is what we clearly have wandered too far from. We are too in our heads. The consequences of a phonetic alphabet, monotheism, modern science, Greek aesthetics, yada, 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 is just to move us too far from experience. And so then this compensating thing is coming back in and the shaman is the paradigmatic figure. And when you analyze what shamanism is, the psychedelic experience is revealed to be the sine qua non of uh, this life. Okay, now stick with me because it gets real complicated. But you know, before I was your little son, before I was your baby, your, uh, your dependent, I was a free spirit in the next stage of life. I walked in the cosmos, not imprisoned by a body of flesh, but free in a body of light. I knew all things. There were no questions, only answers, no weaknesses, only strength. I was light. I was truth. I was a spiritual being. I was a god. But you had to fuck and bring my ass down here. I didn't ask to be born. I didn't call you up and say, please have me. Can I work at Winchell someday? I had this shit. You fuck, you had me. Now you want me to pay my own way. Fuck you. Pick up the fucking check. What is your opinion on psilocybin microdosing? Uh, microdosing is basically where you take maybe less than a gram for each day for about 30 days. And once the doors of perception are open, they're open. And uh, once they're cleansed, they stay cleansed. You don't have to repeat uh, LSD and peyote experiments and all of that. Then you live the rest of your life as a free man on the planet. That's the point. First of all, this needs to be said. There never was a war. How can you say that, Bill? Well, a war is when two armies are fighting. Thomas Young, Iraq War veteran, is now writing a message to George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. I write this letter on behalf of husbands and wives who've lost spouses. 
on behalf of children who have lost parents, on behalf of fathers and mothers who have lost sons and daughters, on behalf of the uh, active duty soldiers and Marines who commit, on average, a suicide a day. I'm right there on behalf of us all. Your and your privilege and power cannot mask the hollowness of your character. And for you, Miss Jamie, and you, Mr. Bush, your cowardice sent hundreds of thousands of young men and women to be sacrificed in a senseless war. I write this letter because before my own death, I want to make it clear that I know fully who you are and what you are and what you've done. In our eyes, you were each guilty of egregious war crime, of plundering, finally of murder. You know fully who you are and what you've done. You may have been justice, but in our eyes, you are each guilty of egregious war crimes, of plunder, and finally of murder, including the murder of a thousand young Americans, my fellow residents, whose future you stole. I was an element tax. I joined the army because I wanted to strike back to and kill some 3,000 of my fellow citizens. I did not join the army to go to Iraq, a country that had no part in the 9-11 attacks and did not pose a threat to its neighbors, much less the U.S. I did not join the army to liberate Iraqis or to shut down mythical weapons of mass destruction or to implant what you simply call democracy in Baghdad and the Middle East. I did not join in a way to rebuild the rank. Why you have come to this decision to end your life? Nobody figured out why I was in pain. The reason I decided to do this now is on one hand sick and tired of being sick and tired and on the other hand I don't want to watch my body waste away. They'd find, she would find a, a corner where she could feed him without being stared at. And sadly Thomas is not alone in his decision to end his life. He wants his life to be a stake to make a point. He wants people to see this. We don't see this. They are not seen. And we couldn't take pictures of the coffins. Suffer immeasurably all day, every day. He was suffering so much more than he was able to live or enjoy anything about his life. He says he's decided to end his life in May or early June. Culture is not your friend. Here's the question, you'll know exactly what it is, and that is how does Frank Zappa want to be remembered? Uh, it's not important. Not important at all. Mm -mm. Want to be remembered for the music? It's not important to even be remembered. I mean, the people who worry about being remembered are guys like Reagan, Bush. These people want to be remembered. And they'll spend a lot of money and do a lot of work to make sure that remembrance is just terrific. And for Frank Zappa. I don't care. <laughs> this world, man. Before I go, I gotta tell you about the world that I see. And it's sad sometimes. You ever realize that we live in a world where good men are murdered, mediocre hacks thrive? You ever notice that? John Kennedy murdered. Gandhi murdered. Martin Luther King murdered. Jesus murdered. Reagan wounded. <laughs> Cancer eight times. Now that fucker still walks, doesn't he? That guy is Jason, man. You can take off that hockey mask just once. You're gonna find, well, I'm back. People love him. Love him. Every fact points that he's a liar, corporate puppet, devil, cock sucking fascist. Every fact points to that. Not one fact to the opposite. But what happens? We love you, Ronnie. Four more years. Four more years. Let's put him on Mount Rushmore. <laughs> Let's put him under Mount Rushmore. They love him. How far up your ass does this guy's dick have to be before you realize he's fucking you, man? Did 
people are just, I like him. I don't know what it is. He looks good on TV. He brought back patriotism. God damn it, he's a good American. Hold it, something's slapping my ass. Oh my God, he's fucking us! Well, Nancy and I feel that. Man, you might know, as John Wayne once told me, that. Man, you might remember, it's Jimmy Stewart. Well, shut the fuck up. Don't you answer a question like a man, you fucking lion, B actor, dickweed, Mr. President, sir. And I'll do respect. Guest. Did you ever notice that? Anybody tries to change the world or really helps it, we fucking shoot him. Started with Jesus, probably even before that, I don't know. Then Abraham Lincoln, right? You free to? <laughs> Anybody tries to help, I swear to God, look at history. Anybody tries to bring peace and love in the world, their new name is Target. <laughs> Your new name is Target, all right? It's true, look at Gandhi, right? Gandhi, he tried to change his world. Well, what do we have for him, Johnny? <laughs> you know? Sadat, remember Sadat, right? He was going to change the Middle East. He was going to bring peace to the Middle East, something that has been done in a thousand years. He said, yeah, Sadat, listen, we're having a parade this morning. Why don't you wear something bright, okay? <laughs> yeah, we got some great fireworks for you, pal. You're going to like these. Sit down real fucking close to the front. It's true. Anybody's ever tried to help, right? The Kennedys, Martin Luther King. I have a dream! Oh, shit! I have a fucking head wound! Thanks a lot! <laughs> true. Anybody tries to help me shoot him, man. Everybody, man. <laughs> Fucking John Lennon, right? Everybody tries to help me shoot him. That's why they only wounded Reagan. <laughs> it begins, as with all significant voyages, with feelings of trepidation. Once the journey is commenced, there is no going back. To consume psilocybin is to consume the truth, and one must be prepared to accept all that follows in the wake of the sacramental act. As the effects proceed, there may be a short period of mild disorientation. Body and soul are forcibly swept to a new dimension more real than ordinary reality. On the way, cultural conditioning is shed like old skin. Traditional modes of cognition and perception give way to an entirely novel form of consciousness. As feelings of disorientation pass, it seems as if one's nervous system has been retuned. It's like waking up or even being reborn. One eventually arrives at a state of mind so enhanced, so coherent, that the interconnectedness of all things becomes breathtakingly apparent. With eyes wide open, everything radiates fractal beauty. One is reminded of Tibetan mandalas, geometrical Islamic artwork, and the interwoven design so prominent in Celtic art. With eyes closed, colourful visions unfold, so complex and so laden with intent as to suggest communion with a transcendental intelligence. As the journey continues, there is a tremendous feeling of being empowered, of being privy to the miracle of the living moment. Profound insights flow through the opened mind. Conscious existence seems more like a precious gift than a side effect of brain activity, a gift granted by a deliberately and exquisitely configured universe. One is thrust deeper and deeper into the mystery of being, as the entheogenic action of psilocybin reaches its peak, sacred realms of experience become accessible, and of this little can be conveyed in words. We are not alone and isolated. Nothing is isolated. We are each a uniquely evolving pattern of energy and information born within a vast system of purposeful intelligence, which we call nature. Unconditional love. I laid in a field of green grass for four hours, going, my God, I love everything.
everything. At the heavens parted, God looked down and rained gifts of forgiveness, healing me on every level, psychically, physically, emotionally. And I realized our true nature is spirit, not body, but we are eternal beings. And God's love is unconditional. There's nothing we can ever do to change that. It is only our illusion that we are separate from God. Now, if that isn't a hazard for this kind of... When we realize we're all one. <laughs> We are, you see, like the radio. We pick up what wavelength we're on. So then, when inquirers used to come to that great modern Hindu saint, Sri Ramana Maharshi, and they'd ask him all sorts of silly questions, like, who was I in my last incarnation? What will I be in my next one? He would always reply, who is asking the question? Who are you? Find out, because that's the thing you need to know. As it were, dig down into the depths of your being and say, what is this that I call I? That's one of the very fascinating questions. It's also, it teases us out of thought to think about death in the sense of going to sleep and never waking up. Imagine that. And you find you can't. And yet, it's, it's, a, it's a thought that although you can't get to grips with it, it remains fascinating. Also the question, how is it suddenly that you awakened into this world? Where were you before? In Zen Buddhism, they have the meditation problem, the koan. Before your father and mother conceived you, what is your original nature? And that's the same sort of weird question as what it would be like to go to sleep and never wake up. What was it like to wake up having not previously gone to sleep? It's very mysterious. But as you go on, and plumb this question, you begin to develop the feeling that your existence is exceedingly odd. In many ways odd. Odd because it is here and it so easily might not have been. After all, if your father hadn't met your mother, would you be here? Now, of course, somebody would be here because he might have met somebody else. <laughs> would that be you? Of course it would. Don't you see? You can only be you by being someone. But every someone is you. Every someone is I. That's your name, you say. Uh, it's me. I am here. And everybody feels that I in the same way. It's the same feeling. Just like blue everywhere is the same color. sitting so much. I would take sitting and doing nothing to standing and fucking any day.
Your car's being towed right now. Well, that's what happens to me, then. That's... I accept that. Getting up is a whole thing. It means I have... First, I have to decide, do I really want to be alive anymore? Like, let's start with that. The very interesting things are happening in the utter blackness behind your eyelids lying still in darkness. The human imagination in conjunction with technology has become a force so potent the human imagination has gained such an immense power that the only environment that is friendly to it is actually the vacuum of deep space. If I'm sitting down and somebody tells me I need to get up and go in another room I need to be told all the information why first. I don't think people should do it without a guide unless they feel very confident from experience that they don't need a guide. I mean, I really don't think we can imagine. It is overpopulation is what's driving us crazy. Inability to satisfy third world aspirations. I was raised a very devout atheist, so we didn't believe it. I figured it out when I was a teenager. I had a near-death experience. I had an experience that took me into some awareness about the nature of consciousness and the non-locality of mind. And the fact that the mind is actually a singularity, that there's really only one mind, and it's just shining through various individuals appearing as many. I began to study meditation. What if I try to go into that state of one mind? So I did. And then I had an experience where I remote viewed and saw deep space. There is a, a barrier a place in the process of going to sleep. You often pass through it post-orgasm. That at any given moment, some considerable percentage of human beings are asleep, always, and many are awake. If the world soul is made of the collective consciousness of human beings, then it is never entirely awake. It is never entirely asleep. If there's one person in the back of your mind that you thought, I'm okay with the world knowing. I just don't want grandma to know. I just don't want so-and-so to know. Yeah. They're gonna find out. Yeah. That's the, and, and it's not if, it's when. This is something that's been kind of new in my career. I have a daughter now that there's internet, there's phone, there's ability for people to see anything on their phone at any time. Yeah. Well, it was time for me to come clean with her with what I was doing. And it's affected her. Kennedy. I love talking about the Kennedy assassination because to me it's a great example of uh, a totalitarian government's ability to you know, manage information and thus keep us in the dark any way they do. Oh, sorry, wrong meeting. Uh, <laughs> shit. That's the meeting we're having tomorrow at the docks. <laughs> I love talking about Kennedy. I was just down in Dallas, Texas. You know, you can go down there and uh, to Dealey Plaza where Kennedy was assassinated. And you can actually go to the sixth floor of the school book depository. It's a museum called the Assassination Museum. <laughs> I think name that after the assassination. I can't be too sure of the chronology here. But anyway, they have the window set up to look exactly like it did on that day. And it's really accurate, you know. Because Oswald's not in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. Wow, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Painstaking accuracy, you know. It's true, it's called a sniper's nest. It's glassed in, it's got the boxes sitting there, and you can't actually get to the window itself. And the reason they did that, of course, they didn't want thousands of American tourists getting there each year going, No fucking way! I can't even see the road! Shit, they're lying to us! 
fuck? Where are they? There's no fucking way! Not unless Oswald was hanging by his toes upside down from the ledge. Either that or some pigeons grabbed onto him, flew him over the motorcade. Surely someone would have seen that. You know, there was rumors of anti-Castro pigeons seen drinking in bars. Someone overheard them saying, coo, coo. Unbelievable. And you know what's wild is people's uh, attitudes in the States about it. Talking about Kennedy, people come up to me, Bill, quit talking about Kennedy, man. Let it go. It's a long time ago. Just forget about it. I'm like, all right, then don't bring up Jesus to me. <laughs> Back into the left. Back into the left. Back into the left. Back into the left. Which, by the way, that action you see Kennedy's head do in the Zabruder film, caused by a bullet coming from up there. <laughs> yeah. I know it looks to the layman or someone who might dabble in physics. This action here would have been caused by a bullet coming from, well, <laughs> up here. Did you see that? Did everyone see that? Yeah, but no. What happened was Oswald's gun went off causing an echo to echo through the buildings of Dealey Plaza. And the echo went by the limo on the left, up into the grassy knoll, hitting some leaves, causing dust to fly out, which 56 witnesses testified was a gunshot, because immediately Kennedy's head went over. But the reason his head went over is because the echo went by the motorcade on the left, and he went, what was that? So there, we have figured it out. Go back to bed, America. Your government has figured out how it all transpired. Go back to bed, America. Your government is in control again. Here, here's American gladiators. Watch this, shut up. Go back to bed, America. Here is American gladiators. Here is 56 channels of it. Watch these pituary retards bang their fucking skulls together and congratulate you on living in the land of freedom. Here you go, America. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. Oh, good. Honey, I heard on the news that they figured out that the gun, what happened is that there is an echo and that Kennedy was uh, asking uh, Jackie what it was and that's why his head flew up. Honey, what time's Gladiator's on? Are we missing it?
Kim. I don't know what it is. He looks good on TV. He brought back patriotism. God damn it, he's a good American. Hold it, something slapping my ass. Oh my God, he's fucking us! Order out of chaos. Works like this. You want to change the world in a way that you know if you do it openly, you're going to get a massive public resistance, like all these Orwellian changes that are going on today. So you don't do it openly. You play this technique. Stage one, you covertly create a problem. It could be a terrorist event, it could be a war, it could be a run on a currency, whatever uh, suits the solution you want to provide. You then tell and we come back to what I was talking about earlier, you then tell the public through an unquestioning mainstream media, overwhelmingly, with honorable exceptions, the version of that problem that you want them to believe, i.e. Lee Harvey Oswald uh, killed Kennedy with a bullet that turned corners. Well, I think it's because my own opinion is comedy is the last bastion of free speech. You get to see on stage at a comedy club someone calling a spade a spade, not any network censorship, you know. And this is when it's good. I'm not saying it's all like that by any stretch of the imagination. You get your share of hacks, of course. In any booming business, you're going to get the, the leeches and bootlickers, you know. But uh, for me, it is something you go to see where you see you can't see anywhere else. Not even when you see a comic on television. Can you see a re uh, him really do his stuff? You don't ever see Richard Pryor on network TV doing his stand-up act. Now, if you come into a club, you can see a guy with no holds barred doing anything, you know? And, and a lot of people abuse that, and they do old dirty jokes, or the people come to see dirty jokes. I don't really believe that. But when it's good, you get to see people, uh, freedom of speech, different ideas, different opinions, and done humorously. And that we are, as it were, simply the dust motes or the magnetic particles in the presence of some kind of field phenomenon which is organizing us uh, to its will. And this is the source of my optimism. If I had to place my faith in human institutions, human religions, human goodness, uh, the human capacity for decency and dignity, I would be absolutely in the depths of existential despair, as I was as a kid, because as a kid, you know, I didn't have these ideas. I had Camusian existentialism and Nietzschean whining and all the rest of it. And it's a, it's a pretty grim situation, folks. But I really believe that without atom smashers, without long base interferometers and all the rest of it, you can go into nature and open your eyes and open your mind and you will see these processes in play and you can easily extrapolate them to... Uh... I that spoke truth. I recognized it, was one with it, and felt as if my entire life of looking to the outside world for reassurance was over. Now I need only look within to that place where I knew. Fear turned into exaltation. I ran out into the snow laughing. In a moment the house was lost from view, but it was all right because inside I knew. At about 5.30 I walked through the silent land a few blocks, my heart full to overflowing with the joy of my newfound self. At my parents' home, I felt the urge to clear the walk, as any good young tribal buck might. Happily, I set about the task. Then the upstairs window flew open, and there were my parents. Come to bed, you idiot. <laughs> Nobody shovels snow in the middle of the night. Ah, there was that external voice to which I had always listened. But what did the voice inside say? It said, it's okay to shovel snow, and it's okay to be happy. I laughed up at them, danced a bit of a jig, and returned to shoveling. When I looked again, they had closed the window, and behind it, they too were smiling. It's known as a contact high. <laughs> if there's one person in the back of your mind that you thought, I'm okay with the world knowing, I just don't want grandma to know, I just don't want so-and-so to know, they're gonna find out. Yeah. That's the, and, and it's not if, it's when. This is
See, I write jokes for a living, man. You know, I sit at my hotel at night, I think of something that's funny, then I go get a pen and I write it down. <laughs> or if the pen's too far away, I have to convince myself that what I thought of ain't funny. 